After watching this video lecture, students will be able to differentiate between the relative rates of diffusion um, of gases utilizing Graham's law, and students will be able to differentiate between real and ideal gases. So effusion and diffusion are what we're going to be looking at during this lecture, um, and gas diffusion um, is basically the mixing or the random mixing of molecules of two different gases or two or more different gases um, by virtue of their basic kinetic energy. So um, gas diffusion, if you have two different gases in, a con uh, in two different containers um, and you remove a separation that separates the two um, gases from one another, um, basically diffusion will naturally occur because those particles of gases are in um, motion. And Graham's law, which is the equation right here, um, allows us to interrelate the rate um, of diffusion um, to the molar mass of uh, the gas, um, the gases in question. Um, so we can compare two rates of diffusion um, and subsequently figure out something like a molar mass. Um, or we can take our molar masses and figure out the relative rates of diffusion. So what do you need to pull away from this is that basically the lighter your gas is, the faster the diffusion process will happen for that specific gas. Um, and on the flip side of that, the heavier um, the gas is, the more slowly it's going to move or the slower it's going to diffuse. As you may recall, gas effusion is um, basically uh, when a gas escapes a pressurized compartment, like a tire or something like that, um, into another container or another environment uh, through a small opening. Um, so gas effusion and diffusion, um, both are referring to the movement of gas particles. Now let's go ahead and let's look at the question we have here. It says that um, nickel forms a gaseous compound of um, NiCOx. Okay, and they want us to figure out what the value of X is given that um, under the exact same condition, um, methane is going to effuse 3.3 times faster than the NiCO compound. Okay, so how are we going to interrelate these to one another? So we were initially told that the um, rate of uh, our first gas, which in this case I'm going to um, mark as the methane, is basically 3.3 times faster um, than the rate of our second gas, which I'm going to label as this one here. Okay, so we've been given the rate of 1 with respect to the rate of 2. Okay, um, we also know um, the molar mass of um, number uh, 1 because we know that methane has a molar mass of 16 grams per mole. So if we take Graham's law um, and basically rearrange it um, and solve for M2, uh, basically we take R1 over R2, that's going to equal the square root of M2 over M1. Okay, if I want to figure out what M2 is, I'm going to square um, both sides. That's going to give me, um, I'm going to put that up here, R1 over R2 squared being equal to m2 over m1, okay? Um, and then if I want to get m2 all by itself, because that's the one that I don't know, um, basically I'm just going to cross multiply, and um, basically my m2 is going to be equal to my m1 times r1 over r2 um, squared, okay? Um, so... Uh, we know some of these values, but let's um, go ahead and plug in the ones um, that we do know. So M2 is going to be equal to um, 16 grams per mole. Okay, and we're going to multiply that by um, R1, our, which we know um, from uh, right over here um, is equal to 3.3 times R2. Okay, so 3.3 times R2. Okay, and that's all over R2 squared. Okay, and if we um, cross out the variables that are constant, so R2 divided by R2 is um, going to give you 1. So really what M2 ends up being equal to is um, 16 grams per mole times 3.3 squared. Okay, 
um, which if we calculate that out gives us uh, 174.2 um, grams per mole. Okay, so that gives us the mass of our NiCO um, compound. Um, so in order to figure out what X is, um, we're going to consider um, the masses that we do know in the compound of the NiCO uh, gas. So what we're going to do is take the um, known molar mass that we just calculated um, of the total uh, NiCO um, complex, um, and we're going to set that equal to what we know from the unit. So we know the mass of nickel, um, and we know we only have uh, one atom of that. Okay, and we're going to add that to x times um, 28, which is the mass of carbon and oxygen combined. Okay, so if we go ahead and manipulate this and solve for x, that's going to give us 4.1, which is approximately equal to 4. Um, so our um, x value is 4, and our NiCO complex um, has this formula. Okay, so um, as you can see, uh, we can get a lot of information from Graham's Law here. Okay, um, when you are labeling this stuff, make sure that you're keeping um, track of which variable um, is which and that they should be basically um, uh, on opposite uh, sides or one should be on the top, the other should be on the bottom. Okay, so the rate of one um, should be on the top if the molar mass of one is down at the bottom here and vice versa. So it doesn't matter if the two or the one is on the top, it just has to be opposite to the other um, variable that's in the equation. Okay, so we recently talked about kinetic molecular theory and the um, assumptions that we make uh, based on ideal behavior of a gas. Um, and so now what we're going to look at is basically um, the deviations from ideal behavior um, and, you know, what, what comes into effect to create those deviations. Okay, so when we're assuming that something is an ideal gas, um, we assume that the molecules themselves don't occupy space. Um, and the reality of it is, is that molecules do occupy space. You know, they're three-dimensional structures, so of course they do. Um, and this very, very small volume uh, will actually end up resulting in a slightly higher pressure than you would expect um, because there's slightly less room for them to move around in the container, um, and subsequently, you know, they bump against the side of the container a little bit more, and you get a higher pressure value. Um, now, when we're at low pressure, um, we don't really see this deviation. It's not really a big deal. That's why we can make those assumptions. Um, however, when we start to do chemistry or basically run uh, reactions or um, do processes at really, really high pressures, um, this uh, difference or this uh, volume of those particles starts to make a bigger impact in terms of the pressure. So, um, as we said, have said previously, you know, ideal behavior works for most of the conditions in which we look um, at gas calculations, um, but the reality of it is, is that gases do occupy um, volume, they do take up space, uh, and so that you, you will see conditions in which um, there will be a deviation in pressure based on the fact that those molecules actually do take up space. Okay, so um, if we look at intermolecular forces or the attraction between the particles, you know, when we're talking about ideal gases, um, we make the assumption, as we said earlier, that there aren't any intermolecular attractions that occur. However, in uh, real gases, there are slight attractions, and um, these slight attractions have to become have to be overcome by some kinetic energy um, and so because there's energy um, being put into separating out those particles um, because they do have attractive forces um, you're not going to have those particles moving around and hitting the surface of the container um, as frequently and so you end up with a slightly lower pressure than you would anticipate um, and once again uh, there has to be kind of a more extreme type of situation in order for you to see these deviations. 
Um, and that happens at very low temperatures, okay? So when the particles are moving really slowly, there isn't a lot of kinetic energy to overcome these intermolecular forces, um, or at really high pressures when the particles of gases are being kind of pressed together um, and their opportunity to interact uh, in that intermolecular fashion becomes more readily um, applicable. So the Van der Waals equation that you see um, here uh, basically accounts for the corrections that in both pressure and volume that we just talked about uh, with respect to gases actually behaving um, in a real way versus in a um, ideal way. Okay, so um, we have two new factors um, here, as you can see. Um, we have our uh, value here, which accounts for the attractive forces um, that occur between um, molecules um, of real gases. Um, and then this uh, factor right here um, actually accounts for the uh, volume that the particles of gases in real gases actually take up. Um, so really this is just PV equals NRT, um, but we've corrected the values with respect to um, our pressure and our volume. So uh, basically we would treat this uh, uh, calculation or this um, equation the same way we would treat the PV equals NRT equation. Um, However, in that situation, or in this situation, um, our values of A and B are actually pulled from Van der Waal con constant charts, um, and you would subsequently go and look up that value for the specific substance you're doing your calculation for. Um, so if you're doing it for helium or hydrogen or oxygen, um, whatever gas you were looking at, you would find the van der Waal constants for A and B and subsequently plug them in um, and basically carry your calculation out um, in the same way you uh, have in the past. So it's just an extra step um, and you're making a small adjustment. There's a small adjustment in your math, but overall, same approach.